We do have a replacement for our previous our speaker that was on your program. And our speaker this evening will be Show Me But the Chair. I did it. And his topic is why enterprise information management is the key to GRC. So I believe it's okay if you have a question for him, if you just call him Shovik, and he would be absolutely fine with that. So please help me greet and welcome Shovik. Hello, everyone. So those who came in to see Micah, sorry, he's not here, but I'll try to do more than Micah. So I've also got Robin Dixon with me from M Files. And um, I know it's Friday afternoon. So I had a bet with Robin that three people will show up, and I see 17. <laughs> so, so I lost that bet. Um, just before we start, just to get a flavor of uh, the audience, uh, you know, what your expectations are and what your backgrounds are. How many of you are, would consider yourself an expert on this subject? One, one. Mr. Hassan, you're hiding. You're an expert. I know you're an expert, too. So the experts may leave the room because you'll learn nothing from this. We are not the experts. Uh, but how many are students? OK, couple, three, four, five, OK. So, and practitioners with more than 10 years in this field? Okay, so it's, it's a healthy mix of people. So, uh, my name is Shovik, and I've been in the technology space for almost 25 years. And this is an interesting subject. So before we start, let's go down memory lane a little bit and reflect. If you do not pay attention to this subject, what actually happens, right? That's what's more important and why you should be sitting here on a Friday afternoon. So we'll go down memory lane. You all remember December of 2013, Target, and what happened to Target? Anybody remembers? They had a, f in that, can you guess how much was the profit loss in the subsequent quarter after they had the data breach? 46%, that was the following quarter. So then we go on, let's go to Michaels. Anybody remembers Michaels in town? So you know that 2.6 million customers, they lost in the subsequent year. People just called and deleted their credit cards or whatever loyalty program they were in because they believed that all the data had been hacked. Okay. Uh, go down a little bit more. April of 2014, AT&T, internal breach. Medical information and others went out. Uh, further down the road, you may remember Home Depot in September of 2014. Do you know how many credit cards went out? They had about 110 million credit cards on file. 56 million of those were compromised. And not only were they compromised, every bit of data related to the credit card also went out. Okay, and, and why that becomes important, they had an interesting function. Along with the credit card, they also tracked how many people, what kids came in, what was the age of the kid. They had a loyalty program for families and the birthdays of the kids, everything was compromised, okay. Uh, JP Morgan Chase, do you know how many households in the US, half of the households of the US, their information went out? And till date, there are other countries, other people in those countries who have 83 million social security numbers with every potential metadata linked to it because it was, you know, household information. It is everything that you gather when you try to get a mortgage. Uh, you know a company called Anthem, which used to be called WellPoint, and now they're getting together with Cigna. All their customers' information is out in the world, somewhere in the dark web and, and, and stuff like this, right? So if any of you, if your blood pressure has risen or gone down because you were associated with one of them, you know, this, uh, the primary purpose is to realize how risky all this information is. And then you will remember staples, you know, and staples, customer information, employee information, historical information, everything went out, but they suffered more because all the pricing, which had the margin file between what their profitability was by every skew, that also went out. Okay, so the competitors have a field day, right? And all the examples uh, that I mentioned, you all, you all can see the impact if you Google. I mean, humongous impact to the stock price, 
customer loyalty, you know, vendors uh, leaving them. So, so that in a nutshell is just to remind you of, you know, it obviously happened because somebody in these organizations or a group of people or uh, there was complete, in some cases, you're helpless. Like the Sony one I did not mention because even if you had the best, probably it would still have been hacked, right? Yes, some of the information could have been better encrypted rather than leaving a password, word password file with password updated as your file name getting hacked, right? I mean, when that to the head of data security, that was the name of his password file, okay? So but those are helpless situations, but most of the others, I think they can be saved or prevented by having better governance risk and compliance. Before uh, I hand it over to Robin, a couple of things in the name itself, right? So the key word over there is risk, and there is no way that you should plan or you anticipate that you eliminate all the risks. So all of you who are practitioners or who are students and you're going out into this field, it's always the trick in this is how to actually assess that risk and what percentage of the risk you will cover because there's a cost associated with it. So as a manager, a technical architect, how do you build the business case uh, for your management that this is the amount of risk that you can eliminate by investing this much? Because it's always a return on investment. It's a business. As much as all of us are so fascinated by all the gizmos that can protect every device, at the end of the day, there has to be a business case and you have to make a compelling argument. So for, for all of us in this room, the key takeaway from this is how can we leverage this so wherever we are, we can make a more compelling argument to make our organizations safer. And, and I think that's the value that each one of us can take away from here. So I will hand it over to Robin. There are some parts of this conversation in the beginning part, which may be very elementary, but we had anticipated uh, you know, a certain percentage, 50% to be students, so we covered accordingly. All right, so with that being said, what I think at the end of the day, we walk outside and we see all these vendors, right? And we have all these applications and your jobs personally. What are we all trying to accomplish, right? And to me, I think the common goal is information management. We're all trying to manage the information, whether it be with an application, firewalls, or things like that. So with that being said, if we did the technical definition of GRC, GRC is a discipline that aims to synchronize information and activity across governance, risk management, and compliance in order to operate more efficiently, enable effective information sharing, more effectively report activities, and avoid racial overlap. That is the Wikipedia, the wiki definition. Take a look at that and kind of apply it. Let's think about it, right? So if you have a GRC strategy, why do a lot of GRC strategies fail? Do you believe that to be kind of a good broad definition? So let's break it down. Synchronize information and activity across GRC. How do you do that if you have all these information silos, right? How do you synchronize that if you have all this data and applications that are out there that we're all just trying to harness, right? That's the first thing. If we can't do that, then how can we achieve a better GRC strategy. So, if the point of doing the GRC, GRC strategy is to, in order to operate more efficiently, well, how do you do that? Enable effective information sharing. So, GRC is supposed to give more information sharing, more effective reporting activities. Well, that's one of the biggest issues with businesses right now because you have all this application, you have all this data, you have all this information out there. How do you bring it all together so you can digest it as a company? And avoid wasteful overlap. What does that mean? How many applications do you have out there that do the same as another one and so forth? This is why this becomes a quagmire. It's like GRC is a very hard topic to handle. And I'm gonna throw out to you a theory. And you may agree, you may not agree, but it's a theory. So one of the biggest issues with GRC, I think, is these information silos, right? There's a disconnect. Most companies are dealing with that issue. You have your unstructured file-based content. So you have Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, images, videos, PDFs, your unstructured data. Then you have your structured data, CRMs, ERPs, project management software, accounting. We can make this list. I've talked to some people that have over 5,000 applications. These are your structured data, your big data. So traditional business information, if you want to collect intelligence, 
It's trying to collect it from only structured data. The problem is, it's not able to really deliver that unstructured data. And as a company, we need to be able to do both, right? So documents become an information asset to lead the business. But how do you do that? The challenges are, like I said, business information tools work against structured data. Documents are unstructured, but metadata is structured. The new technologies enable structuring and unstructured data in back-end systems. So this is where the key comes in. How do you have collaboration if you have all these information silos? How can you have business process improvement when you have all of these silos? How do you give information to contractors, employees, or mobile? You can, I mean, it just keeps growing and this problem just keeps getting worse and we're not attacking the real issue. So with that, what you have to do as a company, I don't care what the product is, but you have to bridge the gap between your core business system and your content. You have to bridge the gap between structured and unstructured data. So what I'm going to throw out to you is M files and how we attack that. So what we're able to do is take an ERP system and a CRM and put it into something called a central repository. This is the theory. And at the end, you can let me know if you agree or not, or you think I'm crazy. If you do not set with a central repository for your company and all of your data, any program that you're putting <coughs> together are going to be frustrating and hard to achieve. So let's start with a lot of companies still have a paper process, right? So you have to somehow capture that electronically and get into the system. Yeah, we're getting through that, but still, you have the paper. You got to be able to get that paper process into the central repository. Next, you have your external sources, right? So you have your folders, your documents, your emails, your file sharing. That's just another thing that's right now probably sitting outside of something. What if you could get all that information into the central repository? Next, you have your structured data. So you have your ERP, your CRM, your accounting. We talked about this. You have all of this information and data that are in applications. What if it is easy? Pull in all that information, customer records, uh, invoices, everything from your accounting system into the central repository that could be linked to documents associated with that customer, project, and so forth. You're getting the importance of a central repository. How many people in this room have a central repository for their whole company where they can pull in all their data? Perfect. Seems to have better solve the problem. Because everything you're trying to do becomes harder if you don't have that central repository. So then your company says, gosh, we need these business process improvements, right? They want to put security layers on things, you have the compliance part, and it becomes a nightmare once again because the information is siloed. You have all these applications. You cannot tackle this successfully, I say, unless you have the central repository that can pull in from the application. Once you can put this information into the central repository, then you can really have accurate workflows. Then you can have security control. Imagine now since it's in the central repository, you can lock the data down based upon how you classify it versus the applications that it lives in and has access to. It. And then from there, you can do audit trails. So once it goes into the central repository, you can see who's touched it, who's looked at it, who's changed it. From a compliance standpoint, you can show that you've been compliant, who's touched it, who's changed it. And then from there, you can have disaster recovery and a you know, high availability strategy. You can have standard operating procedures. So you can show that someone's following the standard operating procedures. They've taken the training. All that information is in that central repository. And then last but not least, Imagine this, mobile access. So we spent millions of dollars on BYOB, and what we've done is we've done provisioning. We've allowed our employees to have email on their phones. Was it worth millions of dollars? What if you could get all this information into a central repository, secure it, and only get employees access to what they're supposed to have access to, and now they have this mobile device for which they can pull anything that's in that central repository on their phone. That's what we're talking about now, productivity. It's one of the biggest issues that companies have with our IT and security department, right? Where's the ROI? If I listen to what you do, where do we get the productivity? This is what I'm saying is going to help with that productivity. I'll kind of get into that a little bit more. And then we talk about kind of the big 
biggest challenge that companies are business information. You cannot buy a tool that's going to give you what you're looking for unless you have the central repository. So once you pull all these four access points in, you cannot have business intelligence. By that point, what you're trying to do is you don't do this, you're guessing. You're putting sales reports together, you're like, plus or minus 20%. It's somewhat accurate. You can't draw the accuracy unless it's in one central location. So, so from unstructured to structured, so I'm going to talk a little bit about M files and who I work for. So we M files a secret to our job is nothing crazy. It's called metadata. Who in here has heard of metadata? Data about data. So it's information tagging. So if you can take structure all content, including documents, with metadata. Tag it with information. Structured data is easy to find, visualize, and analyze with Inspiratrix information tools. M files builds conceptual hierarchy between objects because we're pulling it all into the central repository, right? Whether it be a customer record from CRM to a proposal that was created for them, we have it in one place and we can create a hierarchy relationship there. And then we can show all content in the same view. So imagine being able to see everything you want to do about a project, about a customer, about anything you're looking to see. We'll kind of get into that a little bit more. So what I was talking about, one of my the key things that we can do here is we can give you that granular control you're looking for to your end employees, but still give them mobile access. So we have a mobile app that allows your um, end users to have the same feature and functionality that they had on their desktop or their laptop, they now have it on their phone. So everything in the company that they're supposed to have access to, they now have this mobile app. So I'm out on the road, I'm in sales, I'm meeting with a customer, and they say, hey Robin, I want to go over to contract X, Y, and Z. I'm not sitting in front of my laptop. I can then, with a the search capability, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, do a search for that contract, I can pull it out with my phone, I can say, John, What's your issue? You can say, Robin, I want to change this phrase or something. I can change it on my phone, and then I can save it, and I can check it back into that central repository. I have the ability to send John now that new contract right there at then. So imagine your, your employees now have access with their mobile device to everything they would if they're sitting in front of their laptop. So let's talk about no folders. So in order to kind of buy into what I'm talking about, you have to, which most people here I'm sure are using a folder structure. What's the problem with the folder structure? It's, it's static content. If I was up here showing you a website and I say, guess what, I can build you a website for $10,000 and it's static, you'd all boo me. That's exactly what a folder structure is. So what we're doing is a paradigm shift. It's not M file, we're not inventing this, right? We're kind of bringing it more to the market, but the military does it. We've decided that the shift is no more folders. I guarantee you, if I talk to you guys in three years, 50% of your companies will get away from the folder structure. How do you do that? You tag it with metadata. You tag it with, with what it is versus where it is. We'll kind of talk about that. And then once you do that, you describe the content, and then the system lists the content in relevant views. So M files is Recommended for all the big boys. If you go to research and look, I'd just like to throw that up. So then if we go, what if you can access anything at any time instantly? That's what you can now do with M files. Why? Because all that information now is in the central repository. And if you're on your mobile device, <coughs> laptop, or at home, you still have the same access as if you were in the office. So dynamic content management, folder structure. We believe that a folder structure is as integrated as having a filing cabinet in the back of your office. If I take a file and I put it in that cabinet, chances are I can find that file again, but I'm going to have to know something about it. Bonnie from accounting tries to come into my filing cabinet, she's going to have to know something about my system. So this is what's happening with your employees. You're seeing she look at files because how John might say something is totally different than how Bonnie in accounting might say something. So they're creating copies and it creates all this chaos and all this information. So if you now take it, and tag it with what it is. It's a proposal that um, has to do with this customer. Here's the date and here's the product it's associated with. You now can have a lightning fast search that can be found multiple ways. So I liken this to an iPhone. So let's pretend everybody in this room right now has an iPhone, right? 
You download a song from iTunes. Where do you save that song on your phone? You don't. You don't tell it where to go. You don't save it to a folder structure. All of a sudden, that, phone is, that song is now on your phone. I downloaded Blake Shelton's latest song, which is really good. Well, all of a sudden, under the country music genre, Blake Shelton shows up with new song. Under the album, his new, his new album, under the artist Blake Shelton, how did it know to do that? Guess what? That song was tagged with metadata. Because of metadata, <coughs> one song, one copy, can show up under multiple views. You can think of these as folders, right? But what they actually are is their virtual views. The cool thing is, if this was a folder structure, you would have to save it four different times. That's creating a lot of data. God forbid you try to change that document. How do you update it four different ways? So now, we're tagging with metadata, one copy, and you can view it however you want to see it. You can even take data at your company and think of it like a playlist that you've created. You can create custom views. Once again, one document, now different people can see it different ways, and now we can put version control on that document. Then we can decide as a company, if it's country music genre, then only these people can see it and have access to it. So now we have the granularity to lock it down based on what category or how we decide to put it. So I think the coolest thing about our product if I told everybody in here, what if I gave you a Google bar, and you take that Google bar and you just put it on top of all of the data at your company and do a Google search, how useful would that be? It's exactly what I'm about to give you. Because you have this central repository, and we create bilateral connections to all your applications, there's a bar at the top with search capabilities. You now have the ability to type in a contract, a customer, any kind of information, just like you would with Google. The more information you put, the better those searches will occur. It now can retrieve anything in your company within seconds. Lightning fast. Why? Because everything's tagged with metadata. But the cool part about it is not only do you search via the metadata, but once you bring it into M file, it can search the whole content of the document. Why is that important? You're in legal, you're looking for key phrases, you're looking for um, an ID number, you're looking for these things that are like, you can put into a key phrase, an ID number, whatever you need to, and it'll pull back everything relevant. That's another advantage of why metadata is important. So last but not least, if you kind of take a look at M files, so what we decided to do is we wanted to build a product that everybody could use, because when you talk about information management, it has a 20% user adoption rate. Why? Because the user interface sucks, right? It's really hard to use, it's complicated for the end user. So when we built our product 10 years ago, we were like, what's a de facto in the industry that everybody's kind of using and knows something about? Microsoft Windows. We built our product around Microsoft Windows. Why? Because if the end user knows how to win, you know, this is how to use Windows, they automatically know how to use M files. Why is that important? We don't have to change a lot of how they think. It's already, it's already there. The second part we decided is we wanted to be a product company, not a services company. So all these other applications or companies out there, the hardest thing is to connect to an application. Everybody comes in and says, yeah, yeah, we can connect, we can integrate. But what does that mean? It means a lot of custom coding. It means a lot of money, right, services. And then when they do that, it's not exactly what you're looking for. Kind of sort of what you wanted, but after you spend all that money, it's not exactly what you do. We decided that we didn't want to do services. So, what was the common denominator? If we could link to this common denominator, it would make it easier for companies and businesses to connect these applications. What it is, is as long as an application has an OLE or ODBC backend database, we can connect to it. Well, good news 95% of most applications out there have it. So, out of the box, we can create a bilateral connection. We can push and pull information to your ERP system, your CRM system, and pull it in without custom coding. And I love to play the game with my customers because they'll throw out, how about this? You know, we have Dynamics, SharePoint, Office, SAP, you name it. We like to play the game. Most of the time, we can connect to it. Homegrown, not so much. So now, the information silos that you have can be easily pulled all into that central 
into a repository. And that's the key to what we do. So we can connect to virtually any database. So we're connecting to the back end database, not the functionality of the application. So even if they change versions or things like that, it doesn't matter to us. What we care about is the back end database where all the information is stored. Does that make sense? Yes? You said that you can enjoy a search bar or something that can help any content and provide a little bit. How different is it from a Google search bar? I mean, would you be able to do such a search bar? Right, so is it searching all your applications and pulling it from there? Right, And you bring up a good point. The other important aspect of that is, is the security and control within the organization, right? If you use the Google framework, you know, then in this framework, it gets very customized by who you are, right? So for every user within the organization, you can access them, uh, you can customize it because you don't want everybody prying into all kinds of information, right? So the search that would come out for one particular user in procurement is very different from what would come out in sales, right? So I think. That is really yeah. the true value add of a product like M5. So it's contextualizing the context itself, right? So, you know, you can see our website, we talk a lot about metadata on metadata, because that's really the value, right? That's why you can segment your organization and give the right information to people. So just one step further on that. If you were from procurement and I was from sales, the way your search and the way the document, the same document that we access would come up, would be very different. Okay. Number two, which is important, is you may be able to see some of the sales documents, but you will not be able to access it, assuming that the security controls up front were set up properly. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of investment up front that one should have to do in order to get the right level of access and configure it correctly. Otherwise, there's always the risk of all departments accessing all the piping data. Which is the and then, so you can, yeah, exactly. And you can do safe searches. So if I search for something, and I like that search and I'm going to use it a lot, I can save that search and it shows up under my custom view. So a good example of um, one of the views that we have as a company, we do create view search for company, customers, right? So I look at all of the customers. So I'm in sales and I really don't care, I don't care about all the customers. I care about Robin Dixon's customers. So then I set up a custom view that says, show me all the customers that equal Robin Dixon and have bought the last three years. So now I've created a custom view that I can always click on and see. Now, if a customer, I put them in the system and they're brand new, all of a sudden after I put them in the system, they're going to show up under that custom view. I didn't have to put them in there because it met that query, that requirement. So there's just so many things that you can do that take it a step further. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> that's kind of I, what I wanted to do. My most important thing, like I said, is introduce you guys the idea of a repository and how you can drive government system compliance by metadata and pulling it all into that one area starts to make that journey a lot easier. Without doing that, it's always putting your finger trying to plug that hole and it becomes kind of out of control. All you're going to keep doing is producing more and more information, right? So what we have to do as professionals is figure out how do we manage that information, right? And
And this, I propose to you, is your central repository. Okay, we have less than 10 minutes. Are there any specific questions? Otherwise, we can share a couple of case studies uh, from the conceptual side over and above what the product does. Any specific questions? So, so you know, uh, yeah. I'm curious about um, the ability to see the from the central side to see the document once the editor makes changes. How do you, how do you um, get that back to the source? So there is, yeah. So you will have to build an additional plugin if you're going to do version control of the docker. Okay, is that is your question. Otherwise, the simple way is within a procurement department, if you're all working on renewing a contract for a large enterprise customer, right? So there, obviously, you can define rules that if somebody is pulling it according to the line of authority, anybody else will not be working on the same contract at that same point of time. And they can always say who's working in it. Yeah, that's what Empire Yeah, that, that's what Empire would do. Now, very specifically on that, again, you'll have to customize it by department because in some cases that may not be relevant. But contract is where the value is most tangible, right, of a product like Empire. So, so obviously, in terms of productivity, that is huge because in the old world, you, would, you wouldn't know who all are working on the same version. If you had Empire's automatically know who's working on it, and you know, there, is, there are things you can build on top of it that. There's a check in and check out process. So there's two people working on the same document at the same time. And then it has the ability to show you once that person checks it in, what changes and everything they did to it. And instead of creating multiple copies, you create one that the Delta changes. So you can say, this is the Delta change. Once it's done, it's done. 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 Yeah, for example, PDF. Is the underlying uh, idea behind this is similar to what is any content management or anything like that? So the legacy and history was content management, but that was probably seven years ago, right? More 2008, 2009, that was the direction. But what happened is, you know, due to the evolution of technology and primarily because the value proposition is around mobile access, where speed and security comes in. So now the product evolution is more around uh, the access, number one. Second is security. And then what the customer is asking more and more from the product is about the intelligence built into it. Right? But the underlying premise has to be that all, as Robin mentioned, everything has to be in a central repository. Otherwise, you're always missing out on Something, but that's yeah. obviously the legacy and history of the product. In content management, products still have a folder structure, and that's the issue. You still have the same problem. They have cabinets or folders or similar. Where ours is 100% metadata driven. A lot of others have metadata as well, but our permissions are metadata metadata driven. Workflows are everything now is 100% metadata driven, and that's what that differentiates us from any other content. And you know, there are a lot of open interfaces as well in the product. So if you want to further customize on that, it's, uh, yeah, so your question is very relevant and important because all these products in the market in this space have evolved. Some have evolved faster than others. But I think specific to Empire, when you see on the website the latest Gartner report, it's more about evolving the product towards security and intelligence because that's where the greater value for the customer, the end customer. Because you know, you have to also appreciate the other aspect of this. Imagine you're today to your senior manager giving enormous amount of content that they can pull on the mobile device, right? So then all the aspects of what risk that entails. The other very important part which we've not covered is about the workflows, right? Because then you're also authorizing people to take certain decisions, you know, especially when it comes to contract renewals and pricing, you'll have to be cautious on that. So there's a lot of those elements built in. But what the product has done is also kept a very open interface that you can build on top of it. And, yeah, and you can create from a business intelligence report from a fly, right? So say accounting is having an issue where uh, invoices are going to 45 days past due and they can't even put their finger on why. Well, with M files, you can quickly do a search say, show me all invoices that are 45 days past due. And an automatic report will come up and show you all the invoices and what state they are in. Then they're saying, okay, everybody's complaining about James, that she's the bottleneck, and she's the one that keeps having to be late. 
So then you can take it a step further and you say, show me all of Jane's invoices that are 45 days past due. Or you can create a report that says, show me all invoices by approval manager that are 45 days past due. So just think of the power of creating on-the-fly reports. And because it's all in one place, it actually can show you how long it's taken from an invoice to hit the system and to be approved. You know, it can show you the whole process. So you can report on that automatically versus having to go back in and do research. You can have your boss report in two seconds. So, you know, a little few more points to that in terms of value of concepts and products like this, right? Is at the end of the day, the business case for purchasing and investing in these kinds of things is still related to productivity. Right? And, and the evolution of the entire customer base is a function of how mature you are, how much of a central repository do you have. Everybody claims today, advanced users, they have a central repository. On a good day, we are seeing about 60 to 70% of all data is actually what they call a central repository, which defeats the purpose of high-end business intelligence. The evolution that this product, and you know, if you were to buy this, would go to actually building an expert system. So further to Robin's example, it would, by default, rather than creating a report, would generate a report, you know, which is truly an expert system saying, historically, these are the people who actually default on creating, you know, invoices late, or that's where the collections in this part of the organization is worse than there is in other parts. So that's kind of how it will evolve. But even today, Empires as a product has a reasonable level of maturity for you to build out, a, you know, an initial nascent expert system to kind of track those kind of things. And most of the questions that you will have if you install the product are all related to the fundamental 20% high-end business problems, right? As long as you can model the product to generate those reports, then you can generate the value. Before we close, I do want to touch upon, are any of you from the business side of your organization or, or mainly from the technology? So you're from the business side, okay. So, so I think there, uh, in terms of making out the business case, productivity is one, access is second, and number three, I think it's resolution of some of your high 20% problem areas, which there is a significant improvement. Very specifically, a customer of this product had over 500 people in the procurement department, and to get one contract for one of the large enterprise customers, renewal, used to take 90 to 120 days. Within six months of implementing it, that contract is going out in less than 15 days. Is there a value for that and how much time the renewal in for an organization of that size? At times, it can be for a $30 million renewal contract. It can be a million dollars, right, as the company adds to the profit line just on one particular contract renewal. So that's kind of the value for those of you who are associated with large organizations. That's kind of the value that you can provide and bring to your organization by suggesting this product. So Robin, cards are here. We're more than happy to stay back and address questions or if you have any specific points you'd like to discuss, you can email us and hope right. this was helpful. Set up a demo if you guys want to like, you know, we can set up a time that you can see the product. And once you see it, I, I really think that, oh, oh my God, I can see how this is helping the organization. And then you can kind of Do the demo at the booth? But I guess you have to do that one. But I'll definitely give you my card and let's set up a time and like we can walk through what you want to take. The demo, you can do the demo. Yeah, you can do the demo. Yeah. And if you tell us more specifically what you would like to because the product is so big, we'd rather than only focus on the demo on what your interest area is. Then if you can just send us an email, then we can. So that driving the business is purely workflow, right? It's purely the workflow. That's the value from the business standpoint, okay? But the other aspects of it is the access to data, the ease of access, the ease of analyzing the data, which are all productivity data. And then there is a security component. Okay? So in the demo, we can walk you through those three elements, and then you can tell us which one is of greater interest for you. So we want to thank all of you for coming and sitting through this session. You can have a wonderful weekend.